Grace and peace, you're listening to United We Pray. Taking racial struggles to the throne of grace, United We Pray is a ministry devoted to prayer about racial strife, especially between Christians. We want to help Christians pray and think about race in ways that are biblical and helpful, clear and hopeful. You can learn more about our work at uwepray.com. That's U-W-E-P-R-A-Y.com, where you can find articles, previous episodes, and more. Grace and peace. Welcome back to United We Pray. Austin Studer, joined by the Reverend Isaac Adams. How are you doing, sir? Good to be back with you, man. Good to see you. Good to be here. And happy February, folks. For uh, Black History Month, we wanted to do something a little bit different. And over the next four weeks, we're going to be highlighting a a figure from uh, Black history. Figure from history. That's an awkward way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah doing this Black that. History Month special. Um, and we wanted to kick it off. It will surprise no one. <laughs> it will surprise absolutely nobody. With a special episode on Francis Grimke. Uh, who was, like, how will people know him? If folks know who Francis Grimke is, what will they know him for? That's a great question. Um, I mean, if folks listening to this show, uh, they will know him for the person who inspired uh, this show and its commitment to prayer. Um, historically, folks will probably not know Francis as much as they'll know his aunts, mm. the Grimke sisters, uh, who were, we, we'll get into that. But if, if folks know something, they're like, oh, the Grimke sisters, is he a part of that family? And sure enough, he is. Uh, and so about two white abolitionist women, um, who also, who came from a slaveholding kind of family and were, uh, vehement advocates, uh, for, yeah, for the ending of slavery and lots of things, w- voting rights for women and lots of things. Anyway, that's why people probably, the word Grimke will probably pop Got out of mind. Francis was a pastor in D.C., Presbyterian. Yes. We love him all the same. We, <laughs> was, the one, if I dare disagree with Grimke on anything. Which might not be a good idea. Yeah, which really might not be. Um, uh, and I've, in, as is clear in his life, he was not afraid to let people know he disagreed. So, well, we'll get back to his work, his preaching, his writing, his activism in a moment. But his his life story is crazy. It Uh, is. And part of that is, sorry, you can tell I'm just gushing to talk to about. So I don't know why I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me just say this. Then I'll let I'll let you talk. Uh, It is because he's living in one of the craziest periods of 100 years. I mean, we can say in world history and American history, I mean, 1850 to 1937, that's his lifespan. So in there, we have the Civil War. We have the the, the pandemic, yeah. 1918, Spanish flu. And so you have these things where, you know, people like Frederick Douglass, he's just in contact with. He marries Douglass to his Douglass's second wife. So it's just lots of different things, lots of stuff going around that is just like, wow, this is just a very interesting period to be alive during. Yeah. I mean, I got that sense in talking with Shy about Frederick Douglass. I yes. Mean, it's, yes. It's such a dynamic period of history, but that doesn't make a man remarkable or a woman That's remarkable. True. That's true. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. So you mentioned 1850. He's born in 1850 where? South Carolina. South Carolina. Near Charlton, in or, in or around Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. And what are the circumstances? Is he born free? Effectively, he, he was not because his dad, his dad has his dad's with, white. His dad's white, has kids with a slave. And so Francis is brought into the world. And then, but then the dad dies and he's brought to the dad's brother uh, who's like, I'll take care of him, um, but doesn't really do that. And so Francis, uh, and for all intents and purposes, experiences the life of a slave for these first 10 years of his life. And then the Civil War happens. What was Correct. that like for him? What did he do? Well, he he didn't, he was too, so he kind of gets enlisted into being a kind of valet. Um, and I'm still researching that part of like what all that meant for him. But effectively, he uses it as a cause for his freedom. And then uh, the Civil War ends uh, and he's free and he starts uh, enlisting it or he starts going to different schools uh, for emancipated blacks. Yeah, because when you read his his writing or you, you know, 
transcripts of his sermons. Like yeah. the guy was brilliant. Yes. But he oh, was also sure. educated. Deeply educated. I mean, it shows that's one thing. One one thing probably that is a kindness to me and God's sovereignty are the connections between Francis's life. Uh, and I don't want to say mine per se, but a lot of themes of my life. So my mom was a devoted educator. Love the phrase from the United Negro College Fund, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And Francis's life is so emblematic of that. Yeah. Like people could see, not like Jesus being in the temple, but kind of like Jesus being in the temple. This kid is brilliant. This kid is special. Yeah. So that's why he gets eventually sent up to the North for edu- for further education. And people don't realize, I don't think people know this about Francis, but I mean, he's he's being, he's studying at the Harvards and he's yeah he went to Princeton right and yeah so he goes to Princeton um but considered being a lawyer for a while before which makes complete sense when yeah. you start to see his kind of advocacy but considers being a lawyer um before ministry and then has a decision to go into ministry but um that's what he was aiming for that's what he's shooting for yeah so what was he we're sort of skipping ahead and I mean we could yeah. do a whole episode on his childhood or yeah. a whole episode on his education. But yeah. just in overview here, he... It was his brother who went to Harvard Law School, Archibald. Got it. So I mean, this whole family is like, wow. But yeah, it's... high achievers, a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, so he he takes a pastorate where? In Washington, D.C. Okay. 15th Street Presbyterian Church. And he's there for a long time, right? A long time. 44 years. Um, there's, there's a kind of, he, he's not there for four years due to his wife's health, uh, which he was prioritizing his wife. Uh, but beyond that, he was, he was there for longer than that. Even it almost totals up to 50 years. He's serving this one congregation. Yeah. And there's that brief window. I think he moved his wife down to Florida. Yeah. Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. Yep. Um, and then she passed and he came back. Right. I think that's what happened. I, I'm like the, again, okay. some, yeah, yeah, some of these I'm still looking up. So he's there, he's there effectively for 50 years. What was he like as a pastor? I mean, one thing I love about Francis and he's, he's working before the advent of the internet is he was doggedly committed to his congregation. He's not trying to, I mean, nowadays, you know, folks try to pastor the internet. Right. He's not trying to do that. Now it's interesting because he's a huge advocate. He's writing, you know, he's writing in the Washington Examiner at that time. And, um, he's helping found the NAACP. And so he's that crazy. Yeah. So he's not, it's not like he's, it's not like he's not influential, but he's doggedly committed to this congregation and effectively says something to the, to the effect of, you know, people think the more things you're involved with, the more important you are. But I have made it my business to care to this flock that Christ has entrusted to me. So what Love. you had with Francis was not, oh, there's our pastor who's, you know, well known out there, but there's our pastor. Yeah. You know, he he pastors this kind of bourgeoisie, uh, I'll call it upper class uh black population in DC. So highly educated folks. Um, and he, yeah, he's pastoring 15th street Presbyterian church faithfully for decades. He, I think he did a kind of pulpit supply would not be the right term, but that kind of thing before he got there and then got back in contact with them, uh, before becoming their pastor. And you mentioned that he was, he, he fought for contended for his people. What was, what was his activism like? Right. So, so first of all, I, I think I think Francis, he shows God's love. And I'm going to use the phrase, he'll be pleased with this, covenantal love uh, as a Presbyterian. But jokes aside, as a Christian, I think I, the longer I think about his life, I was like, man, this dude just reflected the heart of God in the fact. And the reason I'm talking about covenant is there's three aspects to his ministry that are particularly striking to me. One, he stayed with his people. So we just, that's what a covenant, it, like you are bound to this thing. Yeah. That's why it's a covenant. It's like, I'm going to stick with you. Um, so he sticks with his people, which to me is just such a model. I think, you know, the Lord has different callings for every different man. So it's not to say that's necessary. One is, yeah, that's not to get into evaluations. I'm not here to talk about other men. I'm here to talk about Francis. And I think that is a striking example of kind of pastoral permanence that I think any family, if they could choose, would want to have the same dad for as long as they can. Yeah. All right. So there's that. The second thing is because he loved those people, he stuck with them. The second thing is because he loved those people, he fought for them. So like a dad, you mess with his kids and you're going to get the bear. And that's what happened with Francis. He was 
adamantly opposed to race prejudice of the day and working against white supremacy in its various and heinous forms and the lack of rights uh, that African-Americans had. And he, I mean, he would, I mean, he's there writing Woodrow Wilson publicly in the paper uh, just about his concerns with Mr. Like his concerns with Mr. Wilson. And so he's doing that. He's organ, he's helping to start the NAACP national association for the advancement of colored persons. Um, being influential in that. And so the man, the man was not shy about applying the truths of scripture to the ethical problems and sins of the day, which is, I think, instructive for us because I think, I think there is a right, we want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And Francis kept the main thing, the main thing. He was preaching Christ crucified. Yeah. But he's, he, a, he's a gospel minister. Oh my goodness! Yes, he loved the scriptures. Lo- like, and he loved he loved Christ, and he saw that as his his work. But that does not mean that was his only work or the only thing he ever talked about. And he was adamant about bringing the hope of the gospel to bear upon his flock's plight. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned him interacting with other civil rights leaders, Douglas. He. He did Du Bois, Bois. yeah, I mean, Du Bois, lot, lots of people, lot, yeah. And we've mentioned this on prior episodes, but when we think back about these titans, we can sort of have a have a rose colored memory in thinking that like they always got along and agreed and were in lockstep all right. the time, right? And Grimke, he was he wasn't like a contrarian or you know, yep, a firebrand, but he disagreed with people. Yeah, I mean, one I can think of is Booker T. Washington. I mean, he disagreed with the policies of kind of accommodating, um, you know, Booker T. Washington is, well, as we've said, everyone is agreeing progress has to be made. They're trying to figure out, they're real people in real time trying to figure out how do we survive under this? Yeah. How does progress, how can progress be made? And the answers to that, even if we believe the same stuff, are always clear, or at least we don't always agree on them. Yeah. And so he becomes uh, an orator in that sense who really challenges that. And he's like, we're not just going to bend the knee to this stuff. I mean, it's so interesting. He's just like, we're not going to accommodate. We're we're going to fight for what is due to us from the Constitution. And so, yeah, not, I mean, it was one one (laughs) kind of little biography I read about him. He's like, I think he was incredibly godly, but the man was fiery. Like he was, I don't know that he's your most gentle, like, I don't want to say he wasn't gentle, but he was not, he was not afraid. He was, he was bold in that sense. And so, yeah, not agreeing with everybody, but agreeing with what he believed to be right. Yeah. And I mean, for someone who was born a slave. Right. Like there, there's, it seems to be just kind of, you get the same thing reading Douglas. Like there's just a, a, a clarity that comes from that perspective of having experienced that. It's like, yeah, we're, we're not going to make any accommodation. Yeah. Like. I mean, that's the thing is he, he knows, he knows these evils personally. It was yeah. not an abstract thing for him. And so, um, yeah, he sought to do something about it in his lifetime. So of all the black pastors in American history, you've kind of, you've really gravitated towards Grimke. Can you explain sort of why that is and what drew you to him and his work? Yeah, I mean, listeners of the show will be familiar, but it never, you know, to say the same thing twice is no trouble for me and it's safe for y'all. I mean, it's that first sermon I read from of his from in 1898, God and Prayer as Factors in the Struggle, uh, where Francis is looking at, and this is a good example of what we're talking about. He's looking at, um, he's speaking to the racial problems of the day, and he has a whole sermon about praying about them. Uh, looking at the life of slave, the prayer life of slaves. And so that instinctively drew me to him. And then it wasn't just that, that it was, it's, I don't know if you find people like this, Austin, like the more they say, the more you find yourself agreeing with them. Yeah. And I'm like, everything he started to say, I was like, that's so spot on. Like when I, when I was reading about him being like, the more, th- the more stuff you think you can be involved in, the better you think you are as a pastor. And I'm like, Man, I need, I need to hear that as a pastor in 2024, you know, wh- who's tempted to go do 500 things. There's that. I mean, 
him being from DC, there's a natural affinity sure. there. Him wanting to be a lawyer for a while. My mom was a lawyer. So like stuff like that. Him being a Presbyterian, a black Presbyterian is just, oh, I love the man. And then, you know, COVID strikes and, you know, people are looking for guidance and whose name pops up, but Francis Grimke. Because he pastored during a pandemic. Because he pastored during, a, we are not the first ones. And like, we need to understand, we need to have the humility and the relief that comes from not being yeah. the first ones. And Francis is over there talking clearly, soundly, soberly, um, and and frankly about the challenges yeah. of pastoring in that time and what God might be calling us to in that time. So all of those just created this, like, who is this person? And I'm excited to meet him one day. Yeah. It's just so interesting how the Lord provides those kind of connections, even to saints who are in glory. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, even like your mom and the way she raised you and the emphases in your life. Yeah. I mean, we did a whole episode, episode in tribute to her. And, you know, she impressed on you the importance of prayer. Yeah. So in that sense, you were primed. Yeah. Once well, you yeah. found Grimke, yeah. oh, well, this is it. Yeah, this is it. And like he, he and her, their stock feels similar. Yeah. You know, and I think there's there was a natural pull in just writing and in, in just reading his writing that I was like, oh, man. You've you've mentioned it in this episode and previously, but uh, is he responsible for United We Pray? <laughs> can we blame that on him? We can blame it on him. I hope I hope he's happy with his legacy, but uh, not that we're all, certainly all of it. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, just the like, hey, he was carrying the banner for prayer. And I think that is a banner worth carrying still. And so that was, that was certainly the DNA that tried to infuse it. I mean, him just saying it, it is no small thing when citizens, however few, however humble, take their appeal to the bar of the almighty, mm. you know, it is, he says it's no small thing for a nation. I mean, that's the, and this whole, yeah, we can have the whole conversation about Christian nationalism or whatever it is, but the man was thinking civically yeah, as a was. Christian. And that is an important thing to do. And so he was encouraging his people who were in much harder circumstances to pray. And I think it's easy to let your, your foot off the gas with prayer, but you read Grimke and you're ready to, you're ready to floor it again. Yeah. Sorry, this quote from him just popped into my head where yeah. he was talking about um, race prejudice can't be talked down. It, it must, must be, be lived, lived down. Oh, yes. So good. And that sort of in connection with prayer, he's he's depending on God in prayer because he is counting on God to move. Yeah. Prayer is not just like a ritual or right. it's a it's an act. Yep. And yes. he's counting on the Lord to do things that he can't. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ah, love the guy. Um, before we close in prayer, I wanted to mention that you're working on a biography of the good Reverend Grim Key. I am. Yes, man. I mean, so coming out uh, with Crossway, um, and obviously I'm still deep in the research of it. It was one of those things that are actually, we actually, I was asked about it and passed on it because I was trying to not be involved in 500 things, <laughs> apply his wisdom. But the longer I like, it was just, I was losing sleep over. I was like, it's oh, stuck I, in your head. Yeah, I was just I can't let this story be told. Like you know, and Crosswood they have a they have a biography coming out about him, and they're um, I think it's theologians in the Christian life or something like that. But the reason my biography is different is because mine's actually for kids, oh, uh, for, for young readers, ages eight to twelve. And so, and I find frankly those kind of I mean those I find stuff written for children to be very helpful as an adult. Yeah. It's very, it's distilled, it's clear, it's short. And so, yeah, so working on a biography on Dear Brother Grim Key, uh, hopefully to tell his story, because I think a lot of people need to know it. Like I said, I think there's so many handlebars for us in this conversation or in his life. And his life is a tremendous example, yes, of fighting injustice, but also just being such a fit, fighting injustice because he was a faithful Christian right, uh, and a faithful pastor. And so... I'm excited to, I think the next generation needs to know his story and I'm excited to tell it. Well, I'm very excited for that. And while we all wait mm. uh, for the book, what are a couple things you would point people to if they want to read more M. Key and sort of get a sense of, of the man and his work? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, there are things about Grim Key you can read, but first I want to just point people to his work. Like I yes. think often when you're reading, it's tempting to read about someone and you can read someone. And right. that's awesome. Like, go to the horse's mouth. And so, man, 
I'll point people again to the Negro, his rights and wrongs, the forces for him and against him. Just a short little sermon series. You can find it on Amazon, like Cornell Library Press or something has a version. We can put it. Yeah, we'll, but, put, we'll yeah. put it in the center. So uh, excited about reading that. There's another just there's another like longer chapter about him that I can also link in the show notes uh, that I found really useful in reading uh, and reading about him. But I would also just point people to find what you can on the Grimke sisters. The whole family, the whole family. will be something interesting to read about. And so I was just pointing to a book uh, that I'm ordering right now called The Grimkeys that is just about their whole family. I think it's primarily about the sisters um, who are his aunts. Um, but yeah, his wife was awesome. his wife. I think Jasmine Holmes in her book and one of her books has a chapter on his wife. Lots you can read that yeah. we can put in the show notes. Great. Well, why don't we pray? Thank God for Reverend Grimke yeah. and for pray for our listeners as well. Amen. Amen. I can start us. Great. Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness uh, and the saints of old. Uh, Lord, and we thank you that this ministry stands on um, our brother Francis's shoulders. And Lord, we do pray that we would be faithful uh, to talk and to pray down and to live down um, what is not right and what threatens the unity of your body. Father, we pray that his legacy would be cemented in the truth of the gospel going forward and the right living in accordance with that truth going forward. Uh, and Father, we pray that... Um, for as long as you'd have us, Lord, that we'd continue to pray toward that end and work toward that end. Uh, and Father, we pray that we would be faithful to love the congregations, be us pastors or lay members or whoever we may be, that we'd be faithful to love the congregations of which you have placed us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for the encouragement that we can draw from the lives of faithful saints um, throughout the ages. And we thank you particularly for Reverend Grimke. Um, we pray that this series would be an encouragement um, that we would learn, that we would have the humility to to see um, your faithfulness in the lives of brothers and sisters throughout throughout crazy and difficult periods of history. Yeah. And Lord, we pray for us, for all who are listening, that you would give us the moral clarity that marked uh, Reverend Grimke's life, that we would we would have conviction to apply your word to life for the care of those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This was fun. It was. I mean, you know, while we were praying, I was like, how did I not mention he lived through World War One, started World War II? I mean, it's just, dude, I'm like, what? I'm running out of time talking about it. I know. He's like, oh, yeah, like there was a civil war. Then there was World War One. Right after that was a pandemic. I mean, it puts your suffering in perspective. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's useful to read Christians who, how did God, how did God keep them through that? Yeah. And that's what I think Grim Key's life is a great testament to. Well, thank you so much for listening. Hope you're encouraged. Grace and peace. Thank you for listening to this episode of United We Pray. You can find more information about our work at uwepray.com. That's U-W-E-P-R-A-Y.com. United We Pray is a donor-supported ministry, and if you're interested in supporting our work, you can find out more information on the website.